I usually I say 5:30 because it takes everyone a little, but we'll talk about five minutes. Oh, Sorry, I'm not pushing it. I'm just mentioning it. So I'm I'm ready. <laughs> oh. I usually try to get a front row seat. So we'll see if there's any. In some ways, I'm wondering if I should be over there so that I, you know, when you're nervous, you get a, you get people's names mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's the, the nice thing about being over there, I can watch that, that you I can, can watch it um, versus having to be so far from it because people presenting tend to look at that. They don't turn it out. It's kind yeah. of hard for them to see. Um, sure, that's that is an issue. So, so and so this is just yeah. forward and back. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Or it's kind of. I think it's actually backwards. I think this this is forward. This is back. Okay. Um, so I do want to mention though that once you start. Um, presenting everything uh has to be you have to make sure that you're in the mic because if you're not speaking to the mic the people right here won't hear okay hi i'm kay you're hi, you kind of know whether you're you know and i'll we'll move you can hold it in your hand over there or i can bring this thing over there i think i'd rather just stand not have to hold it okay because if i'm dealing with this and that I'm but so are you gonna are you gonna go over there so you can see the name no no i'm gonna look from here yeah, that would be good so that I can keep an eye. We can also move it so this, like, uh, I can do this too. Oh, that's that'll be fine. Yeah, that's fine. I'm so used to using the mouse with my right hand, though, even though I'm left handed. You could put it in like I can use it with my you like this. How about this? Oh, wait, you just want to make sure you're not. If you feel light on your face, it means that you're blocking me. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm okay. I hope. I'm. You know what I'm worried about? I'm gonna show somebody so I didn't say the wrong name. <laughs> oh, I know. I didn't know that. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, it's really good that uh, you go first because there's a break between before I start talking again. Yes. So. <laughs> Do you need a clamp? Do you want to intro me? Okay. Looks like a little bit of a chair. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, okay, what I've been what I've been doing sorry, um, yeah. is I've just been reading the bio that people gave me. So I'll just read your I'll read a uh, version of your bio and uh, okay. introduce me if you want. Um, <laughs> 
I'm going to read a version of my bio, and then I will talk about my I'll introduce you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little hard. Oh, I was saying you can either uh, stay up there or you can find a seat that you get to sit in the jewel. Testing, testing. Test, testing, testing. Yeah. Test, test. Hello, everyone. We're getting started. Hello. Sorry to cut you short. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. It's a nice little crowd. Um, my guess is from the popularity of the Women Photographers Collective, um, but also uh, for just the idea that we get to get together every week on Thursdays and, and hear about people's process and about their projects and, and meet other like-minded, you know, photo-loving uh, community members and people from near and far. Um, today we have uh, Jill Enfield and Kay Kenny here who are uh, both have career, photo careers in their own rights but are also part of a um, photo photographer, sorry, the Women Photographers Collective here in, in Kingston, right? Would you say you're based out of Kingston? Um, and uh, Kay Kenny is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about the collective and then uh, followed up with uh, Jill talking about her work and then Kay again talking about her own personal work. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me give you a little bit of background about each of them. Uh, Kay Kenny has received a BFA from uh, Syracuse University, MA uh, from Rutgers University, and MFA from Syracuse University, all in visual arts. She's a painter and a photographer in addition to writing art criticism and articles on the visual arts. Kenny was a photo photography teacher for over 25 years in New York, at New York University and the International Center for Photography in New York City. Kenny has received third place in the 2021 Soho Photo Alternative Photography Award, 2019 Honorable Mention, the Margaret Cameron Photography Award, 
Award, 2016 NJSKCA Artist Fellowship for Works on Paper, uh, among others. Three-time recipient of the NJC. SCA Fellowship Award. Kenny's work has been exhibited widely, most re recently in the Griffin Museum 2022 Curator's Choice Virtual Gallery, and her work is in several notable corporate, museum, and private collections. Can everyone give a K a warm welcome? It's nice to be here. Um, for hearing my bio read out, it's pretty funny. In case you didn't know, the New Jersey State Council of the Arts was what she was trying to talk about. <laughs> and it, oddly enough, I never got a, an award in photography. I got awards for works on paper and alternative processes and all kinds of other things. So I just want to mention that. But mainly right now, I want to talk about a fabulous organization that we had just started. And it, it happened in 2020 in a walk uh, through Thorn Preserve in Woodstock with a couple of other people. Um, some of you who may know, Jan Nagel and Meryl um, Meisler. And I said, you know, I think we should start an organization. I think we should start together and network with other photographers. And we thought maybe a women's organization would be a little bit easier for us to get started on. And that's how it happened. And we had our first show, uh, thanks to Pat over here, Pat Blue, who provided us with the opportunity to have our first show at the uh, Lace Gallery, which is right around the corner from here. And that was just recently in 2022. So we blew up quite literally. As soon as the word got out, an awful lot of people contacted us and said, we might be members. And we had a wonderful group of, of about 20 people who were our core membership. And now there are lots of people who'd like to join us, but we have to figure out what that means to be a member. So we're still working on that. And this is just an example of the opening. There's Pat hanging up the poster and Jan, our curator, who actually did a wonderful job of curating the show itself, the installation. And this is just the whole layout. Now I'd like to introduce you to some of the women who were a part of this group. Um, Gail Auber, who is a member of CPW and had a virtual show here not too long ago and her work which is essentially on nature bog uh, images from around where she lives and Anna Bergen Anna is actually uh, a painter as well and you can see the effects of the painting uh, efforts in her photography uh, Pat Blue who is right here and we have a series of Pat Blue work here, black and white, that were in the show and uh, included um, descriptions, very, very poetic descriptions. They're a little hard to read on this paper, but if you have the opportunity to get a look at Pat Blue's website, you will see, you can read the descriptions and they're quite lovely. Um, Karen Davis, who has a gallery also in Hudson and uh, a just wonderful series of images that are a mix of historical paintings as well as photographs that she's taking of contemporary people. Uh, Jill Enfield, who is right over here and you're gonna hear lots more about Jill's work. Um, Jill has a lot more to tell you about ambrotype and color type and lots of alternative media. In fact, she's written a book on it. Uh, Sherry Diamond, who is works on metal and uh, as you can see, she has a six year project and she just won a New York State Council grant for the arts. Uh, Lori Grinker, and this is a one image that she did that were collections of things from her mother's um, estate that she carefully wrapped up and then re-photographed uh, as a way of remembering her mother. And I believe NPR just had a special on her work. And Maria Fernanda Huber, who um, also is a filmmaker, and she lives right in Kingston. And my own work, which is platinum palladium with drawing, and I do a variety of kinds of photography, as you'll see in my presentation later. But this particular work is actually platinum palladium photographs of snow, and then pencil drawings on top of it of animals as I envision them. 
um, from the summer before. Uh, Lois Leonard, who is doing very abstract kind of work. She's in Woodstock. Uh, Anne Arden McDonald, who actually creates these works by pouring chemicals on the photographic paper itself and creates these strange um, changes in abstract quality as a result of the chemicals interacting with each other. And these are quite large, the, one she, the actual originals. They are unique prints. Uh, Dorothea Marcus, who is also from Woodstock, and these were printed on silk for the, the, for the exhibition. Uh, Charlie, who is here tonight, Charlie Mitchison, uh, wonderful black and work, white work, and you may notice that the hands, who were part of our original card, were Charlie's. Um, Meryl Meisler, who has a new, uh, several books out now and actually gave a talk not too long ago right here. And uh, she is also doing a wonderful job of getting her work out there and sh showing her work at Clamp Gallery. Uh, Lucretia Morani, who is in Woodstock area. These are gold leaf on platinum. Uh, Jan Nagel, these are uh, images that she has photographed uh, around her um, called Fake News. It's a whole series. And Suzanne Phillips, who photographs uh, collages that she finds. These are all found collages, not something that she's created. Uh, posters and things being stripped off of, pay, of uh, buildings, that kind of thing. Uh, Carla Shapiro, who is also from Woodstock, and Carla uh, does rather something remarkable when she makes these images. She photographs the images, generally houses at dawn and so forth, and then she creates a screen and places it over the photograph and then recreates it by rephotographing through the screen. So these are uh, quite a process that she has created for creating for doing this work. Uh, Ruth Wetzel, who was not in our last show, but she was in the second show that we had in Hudson, and her work is predominantly uh, images of underwater or in water. And this was our our second show. As you can see, we had quite a lovely banner that was created for the for the space, and. Um, Karen Davis, who's part of the Davis Orton Gallery, uh, curated the show and organized it. And this is a, an example of the installation uh, of that show. And I just want to say that we are still in the process of organizing ourselves. We have a mission statement now um, that is essentially who we are, that we are there to mentor, to uh, encourage, and to network with our fellow photographers and uh, support them, support each other. And we meet once a month and we have, um, now at this point on Zoom, we exchange lots of information and we are currently, as I said, in the process of growing. Um, we don't even have a set of officers at this point. That's something else we have to work on. <laughs> but, so that's, oh, did I go the wrong way? Does anyone have any questions about the collective specifically? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, we're, we're trying to create a criteria for what our membership means. And one of the things we're talking about is having a membership dues, which we have not had so far. So that when we have installations and shows, we have some way of paying for them. And the other thing we're thinking about is what, do the, what does membership mean in terms of duties? Or being part of the collective means that you're part of a membership organization and possibly a you know, committee, et cetera. So we're working on that. And once we figure that out, then we're gonna open up the floodgates and for people to join. And we're really looking forward to that because we've had a lot of inquiries and a lot of wonderful people have put forward that they'd like to join us. So very soon. And if you want to um, be in touch with me, just to remind me that you'd like to be considered, uh, my card is back there and you can take it and just email me directly. And I put your, your name into a particular folder. And so when we're ready, we'll be in touch. 
you will you'll hear from us. That's why it just takes a long time. There's a committee that's just starting to meet and connect with each other. So it's a challenge. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, so Jill, would you like to take over? Um, and as uh, Kay mentioned, Kay and Jill both have books in the back for sale that you can look at and purchase. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to give a shout out to that. Um, did you have a question, Charlie? Yeah, I have one question for Kay. Uh, what are you teaching at NYU? Um, what is the name of your class? The, the class that I'm teaching? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be teaching, but not till March, photo history at NYU through the SPS program. Oh, not SPS, S School of Professional Studies. Okay. And it's a five week class on Zoom. Okay. All right. We're going to hear from Jill about her work and then we'll be followed up with Kay. Um, thank you, Kay. Uh, if you have any questions about the Women Photographers Collective uh, afterwards, after Kay goes again, we can go back over that as well. Uh, Jill Enfield is a fine art photographer, educator, and author. Her concentration is historical techniques and alternative processes with annual workshops and lectures in locations around the world. She's been teaching at Parsons uh, New School of Design since the late 1980s. Her three books, Photo Imaging, A Complete Guide to Alternative Processes, published by AM Photo, and Jill Enfield's Guide to Alternative Processes, Popular Historical and Contemporary Techniques, published by Focal Press, uh, are award-winning works and used in schools all over the world. Enfield has shown her work throughout the USA and Europe. Enfield was the keynote speaker at the Finnish Darkroom Association in March of 2022, and in November 2020 became one of the advisors to the Li Shui I can't pronounce uh, International Handmade <laughs> Photography Center in China. Her fine art images can be seen in many museums as well as in private collections. We will follow up uh, Jill's talk with a Q&A. So if you're viewing from home, you can put uh, questions in the chat and we'll also get those uh, questions answered. All right, Jill, take it thank away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you all for coming as well. Um, okay, so... Uh, this is me as a little kid, uh, just to give you an example of that I have been around photography all of my life. Uh, you notice the little brownie camera on the chair. Oh, thank you. So this is my parents' store in Germany, and this is really uh, the story of, uh, of my family. It was really... Um, uh, a way for me to uh, start doing my project that I'm going to show you on immigration. Um, it, they came to, uh, to the United States with the help of the Leica uh, camera company. It's the Lights family. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, books on them and there will be a documentary uh, that will be uh, in the spring uh, right now, it's only going to be in German and French, and we're hoping that by the summer it will also be in English and be brought to the United States. But they helped a lot of Jews get out of Germany. And what happened was my the Ehrenfeld um, store was destroyed during Kristallnacht, and so they didn't have any way to start a store once they immigrated. And the Leica family wrote them letters of introduction and enabled them to get uh, cameras and equipment so that they could open up their store with no money, basically. They could get all of the equipment. And then as the equipment sold, uh, they were able to pay everybody back and then start a career in the United States. So uh, we are very thankful for them. And this is the store in Miami Beach. It was on Lincoln Road, if anyone's been on Miami Beach. For some reason, both of the stores, where it was in Germany and in Miami Beach, are now both restaurants. And we ate at both of them. <laughs> okay, so now see if I can, this is a two minute video on just to let you have an idea of how I do what I do. And then I will explain it when it's over.
Okay, so I shoot wet plate collodion, and that's what you saw me making. I prefer to shoot on glass. It's the same thing. So those are called amber types. Same thing on metal, but those are called tin types. So all of these were done on glass. And I had a show at Ellis Island in 2017. And at the time, they asked me if I could fill up six galleries. And so I was like, what am I going to do in six galleries? And so in between when I had the show and when I started getting ready for it, we moved up to the Hudson Valley. And I started collecting these windows for some reason. And um, then came up with the idea that we're all immigrants, which was the idea of the show anyway. And those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And so I made the glass house and it has now traveled um, with Photoville uh, to, from Dumbo in New York to LA. And then I took it to a couple of other places um, throughout this area. It actually just came home um, and is in my garage. But before that, this is on a, a place called Saunders Farm in Garrison and they have cows roaming. And so we had to put up a fence. Um, and at the time it was when they were sending a lot of people into what I feel are, are like concentration camps. They were, you know, in these cages and separated from families. And so I really sort of wish I had to put up the fence the whole time because it, it really felt like it was, um, uh, making a stronger statement. It did not keep the cows out, by the way. They knocked out uh, several panes and I had to fix them before it went on to the next place. Uh, so the next few images are uh, the people that I photographed. They were from all over the place. I interviewed them at the same time um, that I photographed them. Most of them came to my apartment when we were in New York City and um, and posed for me and as they posed they uh, would fill out a form so that I asked them specific questions and um, in an interview type area um, I also started uh, meeting people where they work um, and so I would take that portable darkroom you saw in the movie and um, go throughout New York City and meet them at different places where they worked. So if they weren't photographed in my house, I would go to their place of business and meet them. And when I had the show, I didn't want it to be, I, I wanted to interview them and find out all the information of why they came. My family didn't want to come here. And it was always very curious to me why people wanted, would want to leave a home that they knew with their family and their friends and everything that they knew about, um, about their life and start fresh. And so those kinds of questions were very important to me. Um, and then I would, I made them into the glass house. I showed them um, as posters. I filled up a room that was about this size with, uh, with photographs and posters of the people and of my family. And then, um, uh, depending on where I would show the work would depend on how much of that would, would go forward. Um, this next group is um, images that I've just started since I moved to the Hudson Valley and all of a sudden I found myself having to commute. I'm not a very good commuter. And so I would just get crazy when I was on the train and I finally decided that I was going to photograph while I was on the train. And so then it was, well, I'm sorry, these are so small, but I'll give you an idea of what they say as I go through. Um, so as I'm photographing, I'm deciding how do I want to photograph? I knew I wanted them to be collodion, but I couldn't bring my dark room on a train. So then I had to, figure out how I was going to do that. And so I brought a Holgo, which is a plastic camera. I brought a film camera. I brought a digital camera. And I 
settled on my iPhone. And so I took pictures um, with my iPhone, and then when I came home, I would bring them into the um, just the uh, computer, and I would make a positive, and then I could go into the dark room, and I could actually p place that positive down onto my glass plate and make an image. And that's what I decided to do. Um, and then as I was going through uh, figuring out what I wanted these images to say, I started uh, talking with several people up here. And one of them is a man named Harv Hillowitz, who happens to be a Lenape Indian, or Native American, sorry, Lenape Native American scholar. And he started telling me how, um, what was here before Henry Hudson or, you know, several other people that all the Dutch that came and settled in New York. And so he started giving me ideas as to um, really what took place in all of the different places and how vibrant this area was uh, before it was settled by Europeans. And this project is really just getting started. What you're looking at is just the first uh, 30 images and um, of course, when I'm going every week on the train, I've shot thousands of images. And then I'm editing through and trying to um, decide which ones I like. I put them up on the wall. I keep visiting with them and deciding which ones were, are my favorites. And um, Hopefully it will be a book and several shows. Um, I was part of the Newburgh Open Studios and I've had a couple of the images in when the Women's Collective have had shows. But it's um, something that I, I really love to do and more than that, I love learning about the area. And really just the different names of everything um, I'll try and find something where I can actually pronounce the names. So this is just Sleepy Hollow. Um, and the nearby river was called Pocahontas um, by the local, this, these names I cannot say, um, but they um, mean waters between the hills. And also what's really interesting is that the Hudson River is flows both ways. And that was the name of the Hudson River before, was the river that flows both ways. And it, it's just, everything about the river is just so, as you, I mean, I, I just love looking out the, out the window. And it really revi revised me as I'm leaving the city and coming back home to just, and I can't stop taking pictures out the window. It's just... I keep saying, oh, I'm going to read a book or I'm going to get some work done. And instead, I sit there and I take pictures out the window. And this amazes me. That Sing Sing, and it just goes right through where the prison is. The other thing is just to see the river, how the the different seasons change. You know, when you're in the city, you don't really notice so much the seasons because you don't have that much foliage around you unless you go into the parks. And so just to see the difference between the snow and the fog and the, and the summer is really something. So this is right around Peekskill. And um, this, there were settlements all along uh, the river, and they would uh, fish, and they would trade with each other um, and go across, uh, quite different than the boats that you see here on canoes that they would build from the boats that were along the sides of the river.
And so when I was trying to decide um, how to, uh, to show the work, actually I work with Sarah who's in the audience and uh, talking about the images. And it's, we decided, I came up with the name The Way Home because really I was thinking that I go both ways like the river. I feel like I'm still half in New York City and half up here. Uh, but we decided that it would be the way home, as in my new home, so from the city up to, uh, up to Newburgh. So you're actually the first people seeing it all together. This is right in Cold Spring, Storm King. And I did take pictures from the other side as well, not just the river side, but I tend to pick most of them from the river. This is Cold Spring. Bannerman Island. So I don't know if you've been to Bannerman Island, but there's a whole house that's still together on the other side that you can't see from the train. And this is the Newburgh Beacon Bridge, and I'm home. So that's it. Should I go to the next one? Okay. Is she on here? Oh, nope. Sorry, I forgot I put this one on here. Um, <laughs> my daughter uh, did a video when she was in high school on my family. So if you want to read more about uh, or see a video more about my family and how they came to the United States, you can uh, look her up, Sally and Field Rabinowitz. I have uh, done three books on alternative processes on how to. So um, in each of the books, they're uh, talking about all the different, not every single, of course, historical technique, but quite a few. And the last book with the glass house is for sale, and it's on the back uh, table. And now I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, does anyone have any questions, both at home or here? Uh, if you do have questions, I'm going to pass this mic to you. Can you get louder? Did I see a hand move up over here? Over there? Hi. Can Hi. you describe the house a bit with regards to the glass plates? Um, are they actual? Because it seemed like you did that glass house before you started transferring the iPhotos onto the glass. Was the glass house made from original? I don't know how to say it, you know, at one point or were they projected as well? Uh, the glass house. So I took the images that I had that were made in camera except for the ones on Ellis, some of the ones on Ellis Island that I shot. So to, to go in and out of the glass house, you enter and exit through images I took on Ellis Island. And I ran out of light. So some of those were done digitally and then transferred in the same way that the Hudson River images were, but on a larger camera, you know, on a digital. But to get the images on the glass house, those are called water slide decals. It was not fun to do at all. I don't recommend doing water slide decals. <laughs> and then I have a follow-up. Um, you started out by saying how you were going to fill, or you had the challenge of filling six galleries. And then you showed this relatively small house where they were all inside of one small space. So that, of course, led me to believe, well, what happened? How did you, what, did, what happened? <laughs> OK, so in one gallery, I had images on the wall. And Ellis Island also likes to have an educational component. Uh, 
So I set up my camera um, in one area and I set up my dark room in another area. And then I set up the actual uh, glass plates um, underneath a glass holder so no one could touch them. Um, that was one room. And then the next room was the glass house. And then the next room was another group of images that were on the wall with some other educational things. And then the next room was the room that had the posters. Is that everything? There might have been a couple more rooms that were images and then with different things in the room. Thanks. OK. Any other questions? We have a couple on the computer, so I'm going to read them. So we have a question from Daryl Ann Saunders. Uh, Jill, what years was Enfields in Miami Beach? It was there from 1939 until 1961. And in 1961, they closed the camera store and started selling copy machines in another store. There's another question that is, can you be hired to be a juror for an art show in the Hudson Valley? <laughs> and that is from Sandra, I can't see it, it's too small. Belitza Vasquez? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, any other questions from anyone in the building? No? Great, well, thank you, Jill, that was fantastic. We saw it first. <laughs> um, we've already introduced Kay, but we'll do what I, was most people here I can read. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's do we should we take a little coffee break? How's everyone feeling? All right, let's let's take a, a brief bathroom coffee, get some snacks. We'll be back. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I forgot about the break. <laughs> I was like so enthralled. Yeah, that was wonderful. You did great.
Hello. If everyone could start to make their way back to the scene. Hi, everyone. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know whose cup that is, but maybe. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We will have time at the end as well for Q&A with Kay. And then I also have some exciting announcements um, after that. Uh, do you mind dimming the lights? And we're going to bring Kay Kenny back up uh, for a presentation on her own work. And again, if you have questions at home, just drop them in the chat and I will relay them for you. Thank you, everyone. Hi, good to see all of you again, uh, sitting down. Um, the first group of images I'm showing you are called Snow Dreams. And these particular images were drawing on top of platinum paper that I had created images on from snow. So I want to explain that this is, this is a straightforward image, just straightforward platinum. Um, and this is with the snow and drawing. And this was something I started in 2016. I got an award from New Jersey State Council and uh, had been working in non-silver for many, many years. In fact, Jill and I knew each other from way back when. Um, mainly I was working in gum bichromate at that time. But uh, I went back to it and started working with these images and pushing the envelope even further in terms of drawing and platinum. Now, I have to tell you, this is not an easy thing to do because you cannot erase on a platinum print. You cannot pull out your kneaded eraser and make a decision to change something. So I had to really plan this very carefully. And one thing I did was to, uh, to have the photographs of the, of the animals and place them underneath the platinum paper so I could figure out where I was going to put them on the page. And then I would take that and draw directly onto the paper so I could sort of figure out exactly how this was all going to work. And it was a challenge. And I ended up doing about 25 of these images um, before I finally decided it was time to move on. <laughs> so as you can see, that the, uh, the figures themselves came from various books of nature. Uh, I wasn't always able to photograph uh, turtles with that kind of an expression on their face. I, I depended upon good nature photographers to give me inspiration. But you will see a particular mouse. It keeps appearing in all of these. This was a dead mouse that I added to the snow scene so that I would give a sense of time passing. And uh, also photographing at night. I began my career actually as an illustrator. When I was an undergraduate, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a commercial artist and be a, an illustrator, a book illustrator. So drawing was my first love. And uh, going back to it, when I started working in non-silver, gum bichromate, et cetera, uh, gave me more of an opportunity to really work with the image as an illustrator more than as a, or a painter than as a photographer. There's a lot more flexibility in working with those materials. Um, and I still, I have to say that my most favorite way of spending my time as an artist is drawing. And this is all the work, um, the whole, just about all the whole body of them. All of them were uh, 16 by 20s on platinum. And uh, then I had to move on. So one of the things I moved on to was the stone goddesses. And one of the things about digital, one of the wonderful things about digital is that it gave me the opportunity to play with the image in the same way that I was playing with it in non-silver. I could actually move it around thanks to Photoshop and do extraordinary things that were not really possible that easily in the darkroom. So the stone goddesses came about with the idea of talking about nature, about talking about the terrible things that were happening to this planet and climate control, climate change and all of that. And thinking about also politically what was going on with the fall of the Roman empire and Greek empire and so forth. And so I started going to the Metropolitan Museum and photographing the various sculptures in the Metropolitan Museum. And then I would go back to 
the, the, my computer and take photographs that I had actually photographed and place those my avatar stone goddesses in these particular spaces. So this particular group of these two images were from the Pittsburgh Aquarium. And this is actually was the High Line. There was a, a big poster right there with that man staring. It's no longer there. I wanted to go back and photograph it, but I didn't have the chance. <laughs> um, and this was actually, both of these were taken during various ice storms. Um, one in New Jersey and one in Saugerties. We have ice storms everywhere these days. And the, the lighting from the orange one is actually the color of the light from the street lights in New Jersey. And these were both taken in Florida. There's incredible sad stories everywhere in terms of what's happening in this country as well as abroad. So these were both taken in various, uh, as you can see, swamp areas, bog areas that were dried up in Florida. And this is the part of the series, there's actually quite a bit more, there are about 20 some images of these images, of these stone goddesses all together. And um, I had a one person show in New Jersey uh, of these images a couple of years ago. And this was really uh, the big transition for me. When I went from the non-silver world of gum bichromate particularly and other alternative processes, I started working in long exposure night photography because night photography allowed me to paint with light. So I'd go out to rural areas and using flashlights and other kinds of, of lighting equipment, mainly just handheld lighting equipment, um, I could set my camera up on a tripod and actually create the image using the light that was available to me through my flashlight and uh, so this is what I was working with. Now, I started with film. So initially, when I began, I started with film. And as you may know, uh, it's very difficult to do a short exposure with film at night. So consequently, I would have a lot of star movement. And what you're looking at right now is an image that was taken at midnight. I'm up out there in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. And a truck is coming up the hill and created that wonderful light, but all those streaks are the stars. This is about a half an hour to 45 minute exposure. And this is another one where I have no idea when you do these things, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you never know quite what's going to happen to you. So in this case, I was walking down to photograph that yurt and I'm on a dirt road, it's midnight, and a car comes along, and I know he's going to catch me, so I stood still. And then I walk a little further, and another car comes along, and I know he's going to catch me, so I stand still. And finally, I get down there to photograph the yurt. Camera's on a tripod the whole time, and it's about a 10-minute exposure. And the light you see, that orange light, is from Keene, New Hampshire, which is about 20 miles away. And in this case, I got to know these sheep really well. I got to know the, the local farmer said, no problem, just watch your back because the rams can get a little restless and make sure you lock the gate every time you go into the in pasture. So it took me about a week of getting to know the sheep. Once they got to know me, they were pretty comfortable and I was able to photograph them. Uh, they don't do much, you know, they, they just sit there and eat. So you don't have a problem with movement, even though it's a long exposure. And that's me photographing uh, myself uh, using a red flashlight to create the sense of, of uh, fire. And here I am with the sheep sitting there. The sheep are moving around. They're perfectly comfortable. They're quite used to me by now. And I call this reading with sheep. And this is another one that was taken with film. And uh, in this case, that red dot that's coming down is actually a plane landing. Uh, but one of the things that's fascinating when you're using film to capture these things, you often have capture the color of the stars, and you don't realize how much color there is actually in the night sky. And in this case, that's just me standing there with an umbrella lit from uh, with a flashlight as the sky moves along. And the one on the on the left 
is actually in an apple orchard and there's somebody living in that little shed and it's lit by a candle. Um, this was out in the Southwest in, in uh, Arizona and uh, you can't see me. I'm wearing black and I'm holding that slip by the cactus. If I'm wearing black, you can't see me. The camera can't capture me. It's really kind of fun. And the one to the right, I'm actually wearing something white. So you can sort of, sort of catch me. And this one was uh, a real challenge of a shot. We had to hire a guide to take us out to this place. And this was in, Col in Utah, I should say. And that's the Temple of the Sun and the Moon. And he drove us out there, and it was still light. So I set up at, at twilight and photographed the, the monuments. And then we had to wait about three hours so the stars would come out. And then I photographed the sky. I never moved the camera. So then I was able to combine them together. Otherwise, it just would not be a possible shot unless I had a movie crew with me. And this was in Red Rock, Nevada. And weirdly enough, the amount of light that you see on the rocks there are from the casinos miles and miles away. It's very, very bright. What comes out of, of uh, and that whole Las Vegas strip. And I just, you can't see me, I'm wearing black. But I lit that foreground there with my flashlight. <laughs> And this is a kind of a combination of all of the, many of the images from that particular series. And there is a book back there, uh, examples of it. I'm still continuing to work with night photography, but I also am torn between going back to night photography and going into um, non-silver again, because I'm, I'm still very much in love with non-silver. So, and that's it. So if you have exp uh, questions, be glad to hear them. Yeah. Why did you why did you choose platinum for, for your first series? Why did I what? Choose platinum. Why did I choose platinum? Because I knew that it would be a very um, subtle background as opposed to another process. For instance, cyanotype would have given me an intense blue and I would have had to tone that down. So I used platinum because of the, the very soft modulation in color that would also have a nostalgic quality to it, just as when we look at a sepia tone, black and white. And because I, it's the kind of material that just looks so wonderful on paper, it has this kind of incandescent glow to it, really, that it works really well with graphite. Okay. Any other questions? Any from at home? All right. I think that is, uh, I have one question. Okay. Um, the, uh, that image that you said was lit, lit by the casino, do you think it was like reflecting off the, the, the white clouds back down onto the mountains? Yes, yeah. I have one image that I, I didn't include. Um, no, it's not in this list. Of a Joshua tree where literally one of the casinos has a, a lights that go straight up in the air and it's coming right out, it looks like it's coming out of the Joshua tree. It's so bright, and yet it's 20 miles away. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. They can hear it at home if you... Oh, I see. I, you know, I'm a, a fan of yours, and I've seen lots of your work, but I'd like you to tell me a little bit more about that dead mouse that is in the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> that, I never thought about that. And well, can you... That was the one cap one animal I could capture in the in the winter, the dead mouse. And then he and appears, the dead bird. He, uh, that mouse appears in various. Because it's actually the same uh, snow scene. It's just different angles for the same s snow. Well, I'll look at that differently now. Okay. Well, if you need if you need a dead mouse, I can probably provide <laughs> one. Okay. Yeah, Charlie. Looked like a geodesic dome in the corner of the photo, or some pattern. Oh, the yurt. Uh, oh it's the yurt. I saw. Oh, the yurt. Yeah, the the tent. Uh, well, I saw the tent, but then I'm trying to remember. See if I saw how... something in the corner that looked like a geodesic dome. Uh, it was, you can see the outline of the. Of the how pattern. do I go back? Yeah, it was down at the lower right corner, and it looked like some sort of structure. 
He said you took oh, three separate. It was actually one shot. Oh, that. Uh, go back. That one. Yeah. On the lower right. What is that? Oh, that was a jungle gym. Okay. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what is that? I'm like, what? What is that? <laughs> no, it was such a jungle gym the kids had set up here in that particular area. And that's actually me walking over to the tree. Um, if you look very carefully, you can see the shadow of me, but I'm wearing black again. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, Pat. And now you have more than these three to show us. What, what motivates your um, your work, the underlying, uh, you know, thread of the underlying motivation for what you do? Which these, because these are very distinct bodies of work. They all are connected somehow to a technology. Which, yeah. So. Just technology is, is certainly a key for me. I'm I'm very curious about technology. I play with it all the time. Um, and I, I've taught uh, how to use your camera into advanced levels and so forth. Um, but the thing is, I think for me, a lot of it is an inner kind of vision. I don't go out and just shoot. I shoot with something very clearly in my head, uh, a narrative that exists. And, and I've been terrifically influenced by surrealism. Not necessarily the surrealist as we know the Dali as surrealist and so forth, but just the concept of surrealism of getting into inside your inner space and working through those kinds of, of narratives that are uh, functioning for me. And how that translates is often not that well planned. Um, I try to kind of leave, let the floodgates open. And then once I have a, an idea of where I'm going, what path I'm going, then I pursue it more carefully. But I try to really keep open a sense of an inner dreamlike character that's inherent in a lot of my work. Mm -hmm. But it's surrealism, which is It's an underlying sense of, uh, again, sur the surrealists are very much about looking into the inner life, this, the, the dream characters, the nightmare characters, all of these various psychic aspects to their work. And I think that's terrifically influenced me. Uh, as a, an undergraduate, I wanted to be an illustrator and my biggest goal was to be a children's book illustrator. Again, playing with fantasy. I could not cut it as a, as a commercial photographer, as a commercial artist. I hated it. It just didn't work for me. So when I went into fine art, when I went to the MFA program and moved on, I discovered this is where I'm at. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Any other questions? Where did you go for your MFA? Uh, Syracuse. I went to Rutgers first and I wanted to go into photography. And they said, oh, well, we have a dark room down the hall. We don't have anybody to teach it, but you can go in there and you just read this, the information. It tells you what chemicals to use. So I went down there with my camera and got my negatives and I started working to make a print. And I got so excited, I turned the light on to see it. <laughs> and then I realized I had to go somewhere else. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Kay and Jill. This was so wonderful. And to everyone for coming out. I have some announcements. I also didn't introduce myself. My name is Sarah Danziger. I am the education coordinator here at CPW. I have some announcements. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Um, we are going to be doing this every Thursday. So if you like what you saw and you want to meet other artists uh, and and hear them speak about their work. This is a great place to come and do that. Uh, next week, we have Adriana Alt and Ruth Lauer Menenti. Um, the following week, on the 26th, we'll have uh, Roger Richardson and Clint Woodside of Deadbeat Books. They just published a book together, uh, Clint being the publisher, Roger being the photographer. Clint and our very own Adam Ryan are going to do a Q&A which will be great. And then on February 2nd, Jenya Friedland and Tim Carpenter are going to have a conversation. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. And then uh, soon I'll have a lot of other dates confirmed as well, but um, you'll just have to wait. Uh, we, as we've had up since, uh, when did it open Parallel Lives? 
November 5th. Uh, so our show, Parallel Lives, which is over at IBM, the old IBM as we know it, over on Enterprise Drive, uh, is open through February 5th. This uh, every Thursday through Sunday, 11 to 5. This Saturday, we are going to have a demo. Uh, tin type, I guess, tin type, but wet plate collodion uh, with uh, Judith German Hines right here, uh, followed by uh, some portraits that she's going to make. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and uh, the following week, we'll have another activity as part of our photo club, which will be with, uh, with um, it'll be archival, or sorry, building archives uh, and bookmaking. It's a great, uh, activity to bring family or someone that you want. We're going to do interviews and photographs and you'll leave with a, a handmade book. Uh, so that'll be really fun. Uh, then on Saturday, we also have an opening here. Uh, you shouldn't see it. Normally, uh, <laughs> we would hide this, but um, it'll be sneak peek of uh, or an excerpt of a show that's been traveling around for the last six, seven years, uh, which started the Dorsky that was curated by Sarah Lewis um, using the archives uh, from uh, past artists in residence at CPW. Um, so we've got real, I mean, we've got Dean, Dina Lawson, uh, or Dina Lawson's not up right now, she's hidden, uh, but we have Latoya Ruby Frazier, uh, Ryan Cardosa, is that right? No, uh, Ryan Cardova, uh, and many more. So uh, this is gonna be great. We're gonna have an opening from five to seven. Are there any other announcements? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's it. And that'll be from 5 to 7 p.m. So that'll be fun. We'll have a little party here on Saturday. And we welcome you all to come back. Any questions? No? Great. Thank you so much for coming out. This is wonderful. And uh, we look forward to more. Oh, and thank you to our uh, amazing tech team from Radio Kingston. We literally... I tried doing this last week, last time on my own, and it was a disaster. So we're very grateful to Seb and uh, and Nick, <laughs> and Nick and Will. Thank you. I think actually that was my copy. I'm sorry. Oh, that was your copy. Oh. No, as soon as you started, I was like, oh shoot. <laughs>